Turn with us to the book of Romans, chapter 1, and we want to begin reading with verse 18, and read down through verse 32. Romans chapter 1, beginning with verse 18, down through verse 32. <clears throat> For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without natural, uh, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affections, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now I want us to look at verse 25. Verse 25 who changed the truth of God into a lie. As I was reading that verse of Scripture, and it just, as many times it does the Scripture, there will be a verse or a statement that just gets my attention and I have to think on it. And this is our thought. They changed the truth of God into a lie. Now ever since Satan convinced Eve to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and she gave to Adam to eat also, man has been in conflict with God's truth. And we see the result of this is man then, in rejecting God's truth, came to worship and serve the creature, the creation, more than the Creator. And man himself is the creature. He began to worship and serve himself, particularly, more than the Creator. And this we see brought out in, in Scripture, 2 Timothy 3, Second Timothy chapter three, verse two, and then verse four. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. So here's a list of things, but the very first thing it mentions: men shall be lovers of their own selves. Verse four: lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. So they love their pleasures, those things that pleased 
themselves more than they love God. And so, as we look at this and think about this, there were several things that came to mind. Now, man, change the truth of God into a lie. There are many ways that uh, man has done this, and we want to look at three. I, I want to follow <coughs> a pattern laid out in the Scriptures, uh, three points, how does man or mankind, Adam's fallen race, challenge God's truth and seek to change it? Well, going back to the book of Genesis, chapter 3, and the fall, when Satan, in the form of the serpent, approached Eve in the garden, one of the first things he said to her in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, Hath God said? Hath God said? And a lot of times we've taken, you know, and show how man is, questions the Word of God. But it goes even deeper in that Satan is challenging and causing us to question the very veracity of God Himself, His truthfulness. Many times, God states in the Scripture, I am, to describe Himself. I mean, He alone is really in a position to set himself before us as to who he is, what he is, what his attributes are. And we find many times this is at the core of what man questions about God, who he is, at the veracity of his statements concerning himself and how he presents himself in the Scripture. His truthfulness. And, and we can see this in, in many places. Man questions or denies the very existence of God. Psalm 14, 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You know, you talk to a lot of people. And we see here in Romans that we read that man is without excuse because the creation around, we're surrounded with a a manifestation uh, 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 evidence of his existence. His eternal power and Godhead, his existence, so that man is without excuse. And yet, in the light of that, man persists, you see, in saying, there is no God. We see that man will question the deity of Christ. You know, the Gospel of John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Then verse 14, it elaborates on the Word that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory. You know, even the glory of the, uh, the well, I done lost my. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The only begotten of the Father. Jesus Christ, obviously a reference to Him. It says that He is God. In the beginning, was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. That's the reason in, in Philippians, Paul says, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, because for him it was not. He is God. Second person of the Godhead. In the Gospel of John, in a conversation with the Pharisees and all, and, and over Abraham, and Jesus made a statement 
that Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it. He said, wait a minute. Abraham has been dead in his grave for all these years, hundreds of years now, and you're just a little over 30 years old. How could he have seen your day? Remember, there were some angels that came by Abraham's tent. Two of them went on to Sodom and Gomorrah. One stayed behind and talked with Abraham. He saw Jesus Christ. That's one of those, just like Joshua saw Jesus Christ, I believe, on the road standing between him and Jericho. One of those manifestations of Christ in the Old Testament. He said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it. And he said, wait a minute, that, that can't be. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. He invoked the name of God that God gave to Moses at the burning bush. I am. And they was ready to stone him for blasphemy right there. But we see the scripture plainly identifies the person of the Lord Jesus Christ as the second person of the divine Godhead. He is God in the flesh. Thou shalt call His name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. And so here again, man challenges the truth of God's nature and character. A question his veracity when he says, I am. When Jesus said, I am. They question the holiness and righteousness of God. Romans chapter 9. In the conversation as Paul is elaborating, if you will, on the sovereignty of God. We, we know and believe in Bible teaches that God is a holy God. He is a righteous God. All of His judgments are just and fair and right. In Romans 9.19, Paul many times will quote a, a question or an accusation or something that men have made. And then he proceeds to answer that question. And verse 19 is one of those, Thou will say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Now in this statement, I believe we see an attitude that says, My fallen condition, my sin is God's fault. He made me this way. Why does he judge me when he made me this way? Isn't that made God Himself the author of sin? And He is not. He is a holy and righteous God. God is not tempted with sin, neither can be, uh, and neither tempteth He any man. God is not the author of sin, but man wants to bring God down and liken God unto Himself, and man being a sinner, they see the same flaws and faults in God that they see in themselves. And want to make God the reason for it. One of the more blatant examples of this in our day is with the homosexuals, and they believe they were created that way. Now, God did not create homosexuality, He created Adam and Eve. Adam was a male, Eve was a female. And they. Uh, uh, were given to one another in marriage, and they had children. That's what God created. But remember, Adam fell from that original state, and his nature was corrupted. And so even if they by some chance find a particular gene in the DNA that predisposes them to something, that is a result of the corruption of, even our DNA is corrupted. That's the reason you have 
birth defects and things like that. The DNA is not perfect. It is subject to entropy, which is a result of the fall and the corruption of our nature, even reaching into our DNA. That is not how God created man. He created man perfect and upright. Behold, it was good. Everything was very good. Uh, there was no sin in it. That is not what God created. And man is accountable to God for how God originally created man. And man cannot accuse God and, of being the author of sin and being the reason that uh, he is a sinner and under uh, this condemnation. Man is without excuse, he says. When man rejects the truth of God... We see in, in Romans in our text we read there, God gave man over to uncleanness. And, and here's the thing that we want to see, that whenever you reject the truths or the truth of God, there are consequences. And I'm not just talking about the a, a final judgment and, and casting into the lake of fire, that is the ultimate consequence of sin. But there are consequences to our actions and choices. You know, if a man chooses to drink and he <coughs> becomes inebriated and he gets in his car and is flying down the road the wrong way, you know, in that condition, there are consequences. And maybe he gets pulled over and gets a ticket. Well, if he's driving drunk, he'll probably go to jail. And that's the more fortunate of possible consequences. He could get killed in an accident. He could kill somebody else in an accident. But when we make those choices, when we reject... legal authority, when we reject the truth of God, there are spiritual consequences for those actions. And he says he gave man over to uncleanness. And he describes that uncleanness. Now, as we go back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6, Eve, after uh, Satan goes through his things there, and Eve looked at that tree, and she saw that it was good for food. She looked at the tree and thought, that's good for food. What is food? It's the satisfying of the fleshly appetites. The lust of the flesh. 1 John 2.16 he talks about three things, and I've always said, you know, and shown how these line up. Eve, it was good for food. He talks about the lusts of the flesh. The desires of the flesh, to satisfy the desires of the flesh, the fleshly appetites. It, it embraces hunger, but it embraces all other things as well. Uh, here, the fleshly appetites, the lasciviousness uh, that he describes there. There's uncleanness. Well, the second thing we see that man challenges God's truth on is the truth about man's condition and sin. In Genesis 3, 4, Satan told Eve, ye shall not surely die. And so here we see a question, a question God's justice. Because God says if you eat of it, you're going to die. Satan, in essence, is saying, that's not just. That's not right. And so man many times will question and, and, and deny uh, God's uh, justice. Uh, man thinks God is unjust to condemn him to hell. You know, people sometimes say, well, you know, <clears throat> if I live... 60, 70, 80 years, 
And I'm a sinner all that time, but I've only been a sinner for uh, that limited number of years and I die. What is just about sending me, uh, causing me to suffer forever and ever? Because they don't understand the nature of sin and the consequences of sin. They deny that God is just in doing that. You know, that's not a just God. How many times, you know, well, God did do that. I don't want to believe in a God that would do that. How many times have you heard people say something like that? They're questioning God's justice. Now understand that when man was created, he was created to live forever. He was created without sin. Death is a consequence of sin. Sin entered the world by one man. And death by sin. Therefore, death is passed. The sentence of death has been passed upon all men, for all have sinned. But before sin, Adam could have lived in fellowship with God forever. So that which he forfeited, that which he lost was an eternal life. And just an equal payment, and that is a principle that God lays down in the Old Testament. He says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. He's laying down a principle that the punishment to be just must be equal to the offense. A just and equal Payment or uh, retribution is required. And since man forfeited eternal life, the consequence is an eternal separation from God. Even though he may have lived in this flesh for 60, 70, 80, sometimes 90, some even 100 years, and all that time they have sinned and been in rebellion against God, they think it unjust that they should spend eternity. But their soul is eternal. And it is the soul of a sinner that is going on forever. And so the soul of that sinner will be in torment forever and ever. That is a just equal reward. But man wants to deny uh, the justice of God. But uh, deny that he's a sinner. Denies that he is worthy of such a death and punishment when God says he is. As we, we read in, in Romans, the third chapter, verse 19 and uh, 20, um, he said, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in His sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Man needs to be made aware he has sinned against a holy and righteous God. And he said that every mouth may be stopped. Why? Because man is constantly denying the truth of God's Word that he has sinned, that he has a sin nature, that he has sinned, or that he is worthy of death, and instead they want to uh, lift up, so, well, look what I did. I've done this and I've done that. You know, sometimes man thinks, well, I've done a few good things in my life. That ought to uh, cancel out the sin that I've done. Man wants to see himself as okay. But we see here in Ephesians 2 9, he says, It's not of works, lest any man should boast. If it was by works, man would be boasting about it. But there is no boast. There's no room for boasting. Why? Because it's not because of anything man has done. It's by his grace that we're saved through faith. Matthew 7, he uh, gives us the account, said, Now, not everyone that calls me Lord, he said, in that day of the judgment, there will be many who say, Lord, Lord, have we not done, and they list some things. We, we've done miracles in your name. We've done good deeds in your name. We've cast out demons in your name. What are they doing? They're boasting in their works. They're saying, wait a minute. We shouldn't go to hell. We shouldn't be condemned. Look what we've done. The law at the 
judgment, the books are open, it's that their mouths may be stopped, that they might be silent and quit boasting in their works and quit arguing with God and quit denying the truth of God's Word and become guilty before God. Well, the consequences of that, God gave them over to vile affections. So, you know, when you reject that about sin and God's righteousness, what, what is left, well, you become even a worse sinner. I mean, and you read the things that are described under those headings when He gave them over to uncleanness, uh, the, the sexual immorality that was listed there. The, but if you reject God's authority there, if you reject the light of His Word there, if you deny that you're a sinner and you try to justify your immorality and the fornication and all these other things, well, what, what's left is even worse sin. And so there he begins to describe the homosexuality and other things, but he gave them over to vile affections. Uh, we see that the Genesis 3, 6, she saw that it was pleasant to the eyes, desire to have, you see and want. And so it talks about the lust of the eyes, 1 John 2, 16. A covetousness. Um, there's the uncleanness, the immorality, there is a covetousness. But well, there's lasciviousness now, the covetousness. Um, and so we see the third point here, the truth about salvation, eternal life, Genesis 3, 5, ye shall be as gods. And, and what I saw from this, and as Satan is bringing this up, He's questioning God's motives. You know, God just wants to hold you back. God just doesn't want you to know that you can be like Him. You know, that, that's, that's kind of between, that's what He's saying here. See, so God doesn't want you to eat this because when you do, you will become like God. You'll be like Him. You know, it is an accurate description when Jesus said, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. And it talks about being a liar and a murderer. He's lying about God. But, notice too, that was Satan's desire. He wanted to be like the Most High God. He wanted to exalt his throne above that of God. And I think in psychology we call that projection. He's projecting onto Adam and Eve here what he himself wanted to do and how he felt toward God that God was keeping him back and holding him back. Well, he was so beautiful and everything. He was an archangel. He should be right up there with God. And so he's projecting onto Eve that same thing and, and, and questioning God's motive. You know, you begin to question, well, why is God saying all this? You know, it is, is he trying to hold me back? Is he trying to prevent me from becoming a, a equal to him? Ye shall be as God's. Man questions or denies God's plan of salvation and asserts man's free will over God's sovereign will. It's up to man. Man is the captain of his own destiny, as you, uh, and I've used that phrase before, and it kind of sticks with me because someone, when I was a chaplain with the fire department, one of the firefighters made that very statement to me. I'm the captain of my own destiny. That's ridiculous. <clears throat> there are so many variables in life, things over which you have absolutely no control that can impact your life. How can you be the captain of your own destiny? But see, man has bought into Satan's lie. And they've taken the truth of God and made it into a lie. They've called God a liar. 
and assert their own will over that of God's will. Having denied the total depravity of man, he further denies the election, predestination, particular redemption, effectual calling, and some even denying the eternal security of the believer, uh, believing that having earned salvation, eternal life by his own works or merit, he could also lose it if he uh, falls back into sin. That whole thing, that's what free will uh, in its purest form teaches. But you see, all these things are made necessity by man's depravity. If the first point is true, if man is depraved, fallen, his will, his conscience, everything is corrupted because of sin and the fall, these other uh, things, uh, the, the attributes of God are working to secure the redemption of a people unto Himself. So, rejecting that, rejecting, uh, you know, God's motives in salvation. And see, some people look at that to read that so. Well, you know, that's like God's just making us puppets. We're puppets on His string and He's pulling our strings. No, that's not what He's doing. But again, they, they question the very motives of God. And Moses, He has loved us and He gave Himself for us to redeem us. And all things are working together. God is working all these things together for our good, for our salvation, because He loves us. And Paul goes on there in Romans 8 to describe that love of God. And nothing can separate us from the love of God that's given to us in Christ Jesus. <coughs> but people don't understand the love of God. They try to make it into something like unto their own attitude and abilities. And so we see that God gave man over to a reprobate mind. And so we see there in Genesis 3.60 to be desired to make one wise. To be like God. And so all through the scripture then, you know, professing himself to be wise, they became fools. But man professes and thinks of himself as being wise. He's wise in his own eyes and in his own conceits. Uh, he thinks that everything he does is right. That's being God. Everything I do is right. I'm God. That's the attitude. Um, 1 John 2, 16, the third one there is the pride of life. Pride. The original sin of Satan that caused his fall. Instilled in mankind through man's fall. Pride. Pride exalting himself as equal or above God, exalting his will above the will of God. Um, and as we see that progression downward, at this point man condemns himself to a life without God. You know, he's denied God, he's denied the existence of God, he's denied God's salvation, and he's made himself equal to God. So he doesn't need God. He, in his mind, didn't like to retain God in his knowledge. So the consequences of rejecting God, God's truth, and believing Satan's lies that he gave him over to a reprobate mind uh, Romans 1, 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness. And being filled with all. They're filled with sin. Fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness. Full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity. Which, 
And, and so he goes down this list of sins, and we see this world, and we see the hatred, the jealousy, the envy, the murder, and, and the suffering and everything uh, due to man's inhumanity to man. And this reflects man's image of God. They think he is just some mean being up there just arbitrarily doing things and that's what man does. We see man's inhumanity to man. So we see all these things listed there. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 11 and 12, Wherefore, remember, ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. I mean, that's the consequences. Without Christ, without God, without hope in this world. Uh, Ephesians 4, 17. He said, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind." having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over. They've given themselves over. And so when it says God gave them over, basically He removed the restraints that was on them that they might go ahead and proceed even further with the things they want to do. They have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. What a sad thing. There are consequences. They turned the truth of God into a lie. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. God says one thing, man says something else, and, and he prefers what he has said. And so in doing so, they make God a liar. That's what he said over there in 1 John. So you deny this, said you make God a liar. Um, Romans 3, 4, he said, let God be true. Let God be true. And every man a liar. If there is a conflict between that which God has said. Now it's one thing when people honestly are trying to study the scriptures and determine what exactly did God say because they believe that God is true. They believe that His Word is true and they're just honestly seeking to understand what exactly did God say. That's one thing. But when there is a conflict, when man says, this is what I believe. God says this, but I don't believe that. This is what I believe then the admonition to us is let God be true and every man a liar. Every man, it's the year of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father, you will do. He was a liar from the beginning. He abode not in the truth. When he lies, he lies of his own self. He's the father of it. When we lie, we are evidencing and manifesting we are of our father the devil and the lust of our father uh, we are doing. Let God be true. And every man a liar. We, God is holy, just, and good. That is his nature. He is the creator. All things are His. All things belong to Him. All things were created for His honor and glory and for His pleasure. 
And we have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we are under a just condemnation because our deeds are evil and sinful. And God has revealed to us that He so loved mankind, Adam's fallen race, whom He had created for Himself for friendship, for fellowship, for communion. That he had desired to redeem man. He could have just destroyed everything and started over, but he didn't do that. He has purposed to redeem a people unto himself. And He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, who became flesh and came into this world. And He lived a perfect life and also suffered the enmity of mankind and gave Himself a sacrifice and died in our place. And died for our sin. Our sin was laid upon Him. And He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us and as such received unto himself the wrath of God for our sins. And he suffered and died there upon the cross that we might have the forgiveness of sin, that we might be restored unto eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. This is what God has revealed to us in his word. This is the love of God has been made manifest to us in this act. And we need to repent and confess our sin unto Him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only approach and the only way of salvation. It's not of works. It's not of any merit on our part. It's not by any sacrifice or penance or anything like that that we might do and inflict upon ourselves. Again, that would just be our own works. No, it is completely and totally by God's grace, unmerited favor. And it is through faith, not of works. Even, and he said, even that's not of ourselves, it's a gift of God. We would put our faith and trust and confidence in God and His Son, Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, when we do, when we call upon Him, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can have the forgiveness of sin. We must embrace the truth. God's truth. Not Satan's lie. Not man's lie. Only through acknowledging, submitting ourselves to the truth of God's Word, the truth of God, and His offer of salvation and means of salvation that He has provided may we truly achieve our potential and have the forgiveness of sin, have everlasting life, a life that is forever in the presence of and in fellowship and in harmony with God throughout all eternity. He described for us that blessedness, the new heavens, the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness that holy city, the new Jerusalem. And that is true. That is real. Hell is also real. It's also true. The consequences of sin is true. So, we do have that laid before us. He said, I've put before you life and death good and evil <clears throat> choose life 
choose life? Why would you choose <coughs> destruction, judgment, condemnation? To do nothing is to choose death. He said, choose life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Let us stand together.